With Pokemon Scarlet and Violet just around the corner, now looked like a good time to look back on one of the most diversive games in the history of the franchise, Pokemon Sword and Shield. Let's go back to the start. On 27th of February 2019, we got a glimpse of the first titles, with them being announced in a Pokemon Direct. The initial hype was massive. This would be the first mainline Pokemon title on a home console. The promise of the franchise taking that next step to a true 3D experience was a massive draw to long time and new fans alike. However, things quickly went downhill from here. The more that information came out, the more hate the games got. From the graphics, the animations, and of course, Dexit. In a post E3 interview, it got confirmed that not all Pokemon will be obtainable within the games. And after a lot of discussion, we decided to come to kind of a new direction. And so what that means for Pokemon Sword and Shield is that players will be able to transfer their Pokemon from Pokemon Home only if they appear in the Galar region Pokedex. The backlash to this was huge. The internet exploded in anger as the possibility of not using your favorite Pokemon became a massive talking point. The franchise has always been about building relationships with your partner Pokemon, fighting alongside them as you overcome evil and attempt to become the champion of a region. It felt like the franchise was ripping this away after 25 years and telling you that you could only do this with Pokemon that they have decided. As more information came out, people started to get angry. A petition to boycott the franchise was made. That petition went so well that the games became the fastest selling titles on the Switch. Okay, maybe it didn't go that well. So, was the game actually good? Did it deserve the accolade of the fastest selling title on the Switch? Did it deserve any of the hate it received before the game came out? Well, these are complicated questions that everyone will have a different answer to. But let's take a look back at the games and see how they hold up. The first thing I want to look at is the new Pokemon they added to the game. Removing the old ones was already controversial, however they could recover this if the new ones were well received. The starter Pokemon didn't get us off to a great start. Cinderace is a bit like Marmite, it's either loved or hated. Personally, I'm not a fan of it because of how humanised it is. However, it is a strong Pokemon that sees a lot of competitive play, so I do see why people like it. Inteleon, well, the less said about this one, the better. Rillaboom, however, I love Rillaboom. Most people do. The general consensus that I've seen online is that it is the best designed of the three starters this generation. My main issue, though, is why does it have the drum? There's this theme in the Gala region of Pokemon being based on music, specifically rock music. The two best examples of this are with Toxtricity and Obstagoon. Toxtricity is a smart design, it has a guitar built into its body. The same can be said for Obstagoon, this is the singer of the band and that comes across in its design. I get that Rillaboom is the drummer for the band, so it has a drum. That being said, it's also a gorilla, an animal that is known for beating its chest. So why isn't the drum part of its chest as the design, why is it its separate entity? This just feels like a missed opportunity. Now that is a phrase that can be used a lot when talking about Sword and Shield. Missed opportunities. The thought was there, and you can see where they wanted to go with it, but not everything is done as well as it could have been. Another prime example of these missed opportunities is with the fossil Pokemon. The idea of the fossils being mismatched and put together, reborn wrong, is a great one, and something that does reflect what happens in real life with dinosaur fossils. A lot of people say that the four fossil Pokemon are ugly and that's a bad thing, but I quite like it because the whole point is that they are abominations of two Pokemon just mashed together. The missed opportunity here is not also giving us the Pokemon if they were correctly placed together. This would have not only made for an amazing design and helped people understand the ugly Pokemon, this would also make for some great in-game world lore and open up the door to this happening for other Pokemon. What if someone had a Kabuto and a Armanite fossil and put them together wrong? Or a Cradilly and a, I don't know, a Tyrantum fossil and put them together wrong? Like, that would be such a cool thing to see, but I feel like it's not going to happen because they couldn't even give us the full Pokemon together. It just feels like another idea like Game Freak went 75% of the way to making good and just couldn't push it that little bit further. This almost there design plagues the game in so many ways, and it's easiest to see in the actual roads and routes. So many areas look nice, but just have nothing in them. The biggest culprit for this is the Glimwood Tangle, a fairy inhabited forest that's full of charm and wonder. So why is it so small? Viridian Forest is bigger and easier to get lost in, and that was designed for the Game Boy over 20 years ago. Every route in this game suffers from this, it's all just straight lines. The caves in Pokemon are known for their multi-layered approach that leaves them full of secrets and gives you reasons to backtrack as you unlock new abilities such as Surf, Rock Climb or Strength. In Sword and Shield, the entire route is unlocked from the first time you get there, but it doesn't really take long to discover everything. You have one clearly laid out main path that you are supposed to follow, and there may be, occasionally in some routes, a side path that takes you to nothing and may have a, such a, something such as a TM there. This lack of exploration really kills the adventure feeling that previous games provide. It's not all bad though, we have to praise the wild area. Sure it has its flaws, Pokemon popping in and out and the graphical looks compared to even the rest of the game aren't great, but 
realistically, that's about all it has in terms of issues. For me, the Wild Area is the single biggest advancement Pokemon has made since the physical special split. The Wild Area allows for the first time everyone to have a truly unique experience. Sure, previous games people do have different teams, I might have a Pidgey, my friend has a Spearow, but both are available to us at the same time, in the same place, all of the time. That's not the case here. The Wild Area changes daily in every section. When I first played the game and got here, the Pokemon I came across were the likes of Snowrun, while my friends found a Tyrogue. My brother actually sent me a picture on the first day he played it of him catching a Riolu, which was the first Pokemon he came across in the Wild Area. Meanwhile, the first thing I caught in the Wild Area was a Duskull. This variety offers so much replayability and a level of team building that no Pokemon game before has been able to offer. It definitely served as a base for Legends Arceus and hopefully Scarlet and Violet as well. So what's the story like? Well, to be honest, it's not very good. To be fair, Pokemon rarely has good stories. That is saved for the spin-offs. This one felt slow, with a constant stop-start feel due to how many times Hop and company just interrupt your progress for seemingly no reason a lot of them. Sure, sometimes it is to progress the story, but a lot of the time they just run up to you to just tell you random things and then leave. It, it doesn't make much sense. The game also tried to add a twist in terms of the villain, but I think everyone could see who it was going to be quite easily from the beginning. And also the evil team of the game, if you can even really call them that, are just fans of a rival trainer that again offer nothing to the story and just seem there as a roadblock to extend the length of the game more than to actually provide anything. This game also suffers from a lack of any side story. In previous games you have a legendary trio or a legendary quad that have something happening in the background that goes on alongside the main story. So, for example, in Ruby Sapphire, you know, you've got all the Reggie stuff happening and you can find them as you're going along and it just offers more mystery to the world. Sword and Shield doesn't offer this as there's no actual side legendary in the game. You have your two box legendaries and Eternatus, and that's it. This lack of a second legendary trio really does dampen the lack of exploration that the roots already don't offer. We should also look at the gimmick of the game, Dynamaxing. In this, Pokemon become big for three turns, get access to special moves, with some Pokemon actually taking this to another level of Gigantamaxing, which is the exact same thing, they just have a different sprite. As a concept on its own, it's kind of weak. I think it's better than Z-moves, worse than Megas. However, the implementation of it was without a doubt better than both Z-moves and Megas. But not for the reason you're thinking, not for how it handles in a fight. For me, it's what it added to the world in terms of raids. Dynamax allowed us to have raids. Raids are one of the most fun things to do in this game. You go there, you team up with your friends, you battle a strong Pokemon, you catch it, you have a chance to shiny hunt together. It's great fun, it provides a lot of replayability. I am a big fan of raids and I really hope they do return in Scarlet and Violet. We will come on to the cooperative side of this game soon. Sword and Shield did a lot of firsts for the franchise. One of these was the DLC. Previously, we have received updated versions of the titles or sequels. This time, it was DLC, and for me, this is where the game really shined, and it, if this was there from the start, I think the game would have been a lot better received than it was. The base game has a distinct lack of post-game content, while the DLC offers probably the most replayability of every Pokemon game ever. To start with, it added over 100 Pokemon that died from Dexit, they've come back. We also get Two new side legendaries in the form of regional birds and regis. We also get the Swords of Justice making a return. And on top of this, we get an entire new legendary trio of Calyrex and its two horses that has its whole storyline. The game went from having no side story or post-game content, having four new legendary groups that are not just huntable, but also have their own stories and require you to do side quests to find them as well. Suddenly, a lot of the issues of the game have just been resolved completely from this one DLC. Now let's just go back a minute to what I said about the raids and how it was a really fun co-op feature. The DLC also expanded upon this in the form of Dynamax Adventures. In my opinion, this is the single best thing Pokemon has ever done. You can team up with up to three friends, so there's four of you, and you take down waves of powerful Pokemon in this dungeon crawler-like minigame, and at the end of it, you fight and capture a legendary. The beauty of this game mode, though, really comes from the fact that you don't use your own Pokemon. It would be so easy to come in there with four Mewtwo's and one hit kill everything. Instead, you get given a random Pokemon. It's one thing having four Mewtwo's to take out a Rayquaza, it's another when you've got to take out a Rayquaza with a Mr. Mime, a Tauros, a Vikavolt and a Quillfish. It's so much fun, me and my friends have put countless hours into it, and to top it all off it gives you massive shiny odds. If you have a shiny charm, it's 1 in 100, making shiny hunting fun, easy, cooperative, and also gives you a really good chance of getting shiny legendaries and ultra beasts. Overall, I think Sword and Shield are decent games that become very good games if you have the DLC. The hate it got before the release was understandable, but the Wild Area's ability to make so many Pokemon available from the get-go kind of made Dexit not as big of a deal as it first appeared. The DLC did fix a lot of issues with the story, offered replayability, and offered a great co-op experience. 
The game isn't perfect, the story's boring, the characters are forgettable, some design choices are strange, but it's fun. It's extremely fun. One thing I haven't even spoken about is how good the customization is on this game. How good your clothes can be, your face, your hair, your makeup, you've got so much to do on it. It sets a great foundation for Game Freak to develop 3D Pokemon in the future. We've already seen how that can be done with Legends Arceus building upon the wild area. So let's see how Scarlet and Violet builds upon it as a whole game. I think in the future these will be looked back on as flawed but impactful and will get a lot of praise going into the future.